but there are a lot of different types of benefits that that we and others see coming from the DCP. Probably the biggest category, the one that we certainly spend a lot of time analyzing, is the benefits to urban water agencies. And the incremental water supplies that are protected by the DCP, essentially they allow urban agencies like those in Southern California to put more water into storage, regardless of when the incremental supplies occur. And then that allows them to enter into drought periods with more water in reserve. That in turn results in fewer and smaller shortages for business and uh, residential customers. And that all has tremendous value. Is that a lot of people have come to the conclusion the status quo in the Delta is unsustainable. One way or another, things are gonna change. And one thing that this effort has done is shown a light on how climate impacts might affect things in the Delta, and in particular affect deliveries on the state water project. You know, we stand to lose something like a quarter of state water project deliveries just by 2070 as a result of sea level rise. Well, that, that number, that gets people's attention and it puts the costs of doing nothing in perspective. If you ask most urban water managers, especially in Southern California, how they would cope with losing a quarter of their state water project supplies, that's a tough question to answer. Right. And it would require some pretty dramatic measures and some pretty large shortages, especially in dry periods. So one important thing here is framing. Well, yes, there are billions associated with the cost of the DCP doing nothing, riding into the future with climate change under our existing infrastructure is in fact even more expensive. Having that project be able to continue in the face of climate change is critically important for California. With climate change, we know that we're going to have changes in our precipitation and hydrologic patterns that are going to change the way the state water project functions. So we're expecting to have uh, more rain instead of snow, flashier storm events, and more extreme precipitation swings from drought to flood. And when you start to factor those into how the state water project works, and the state water project is built on the, the historic hydrologic pattern that isn't going to be there anymore, but when you factor in those changes, we really see decline. So between now and about 2070, I think we lose about 22% of the water supply from the state water project because of climate change. And that's water that's relied on uh, by, by all of those areas. And not only that, many of those areas sort of use and reuse that water. It's the foundation for groundwater recharge projects, for water recycling. And so it, we, use, we, we lose it on multiple fronts, I guess. If you look at Southern California as a whole, about half the water used in Southern California comes from local sources, groundwater primarily, uh, but some others as well. About a quarter historically has come from the Colorado River, that's declining certainly, and about a quarter has come from the Delta. So just to put things in perspective. Mm -hmm. And and Carrie's right, the, the area that's served by the State Water Project not only is the state water project big, but the economy it services is big. It's about $2.3 trillion in annual income is produced just within the state water project service territory. And that's dependent on the importation of surface water to keep that going, just given the climate in California. The other thing that, that I wanted to mention is the seismic resilience. You know, we, we also are really concerned about the risk that if there is a delta levee failure or multiple delta levee failures, the salinity intrusion that would result from that could take the delta supply facilities offline for almost a year and the water supply or water quality impacts would, uh, would reduce supplies for probably about another year. been interested in in reaching out to communities and having two-way discussions about the types of effects the project might have and how to avoid them. I think one of the important things to, to think about is the idea that we understand that the benefits of the project are going to be felt within the state water project areas, which I mentioned earlier, do not include the Delta. 
but the impacts of construction are going to be in the Delta. And so this is a pretty large construction effort. And we, we understand that, that while we work as much as we can to reduce those effects through the conceptual design and through the mitigation included in the EIR, there will be some, some things that they are left to endure. And that really has been the reason that we've started developing a community benefits program. Uh, we've been working to develop that program with the communities. We wanna make sure that, that we're not telling them what they want, that they're telling us what they want. And through that interaction, we've developed a program that includes two key pieces. One of them is a grant fund. So we would be funding community-driven projects that could help the communities. And then the other is uh, what we call implementation commitments. So things like local job, local job targets, um, training, and what could be things like leave behinds. So for example, if we're building a park and ride and the community would like it to remain when the project is over, we could leave that behind and, and the community could take that over. The incremental amount of water that the DCP saves, um, so by, by combating climate impacts is about 400,000 acre feet per year. So to put that into perspective, the Carlsbad desalination project, which when it was built was the largest desalination project in the Western hemisphere, yeah. it would take eight of those to achieve the same water supply benefits as the DCP. As part of our economic assessment of the DCP, we looked at the cost of the water generated by it compared to the cost of desalination, recycling, stormwater capture, water conservation. And what we found is that generally the DCP, while again, it is real money, not trying to minimize that, it's actually substantially cheaper than the cost of many other water supply alternatives that are available. So what risks are we then able to help offset by being able to, to do this new configuration of the project? So I think one of the concerns we hear a lot is the idea that by adding a North Delta intake, that we are essentially abandoning the Delta, that there's this idea that we would be diverting state water project water in the North Delta, and we would not be helping maintain water quality or have water flowing through the Delta. And I think that that's a, a pretty strong misconception in how the, pro the project would operate. We would still be using the South Delta facility. This isn't replacing our existing South Delta diversion, it's adding to it. And during most of the time, we would be continuing to operate that South Delta diversion as we do now. So I think I just wanted to highlight the idea that, that with sea level rise, there is an inherent water quality issue associated with that water moving into the Delta. And by having a sustainable state water project, that really does help manage the water quality in the Delta, both for uh, for the state water project, but also for the environment and other water users in the Delta. I agree. I think modernizing the state water project is really the underlying theme of what we're looking at here. You know, we have this incredibly important resource to California and really the nation and the world when you look at the resources that it supports within the state water project service area. And so allowing it to continue to degrade and performance to continue to decline really affects those areas in, in dramatic ways. Having to replace those supplies with new alternate supplies is more expensive and, and has its own suite of environmental impacts that we cannot avoid. What our study shows overall is that the benefits are over two times greater than the costs. So there's a safety margin in there. If things don't turn out exactly the way we think, either on the benefit side or the cost side, there's still a very high likelihood that we'll look back a few decades in the future and say, gosh, that was a great investment. You know, so to the, to the extent that we're able to forecast the future, uh, this sure looks like a good project from my point of view.